Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so to start off this performance talk, welcome to potentially the juiciest talk of the day. Um, you have people who are nice and hangry before lunch here. Um, so uh, just to be clear, um, there were some kind of questions in uh, our moderation tool for this panel that were um, kind of overlapping with some previous talks because kind of performance is everywhere, right? So if you look at the, um, um, some of the questions relating to kind of um, strictly kind of network performance things, uh, those are mostly covered in previous talks. So we'll mostly skip over those. Uh, so now is your moment to put in any juicier questions for front end things, especially graphics um, and all the kind of client side related performance concerns you guys have. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to run through. We've got uh, our opening speaker here, Shane O'Sullivan. Um, so he's from Facebook, uh, UI engineer. Um, he'll introduce himself a little bit more. Uh, we have Pavel Feldman uh, from Google. He's uh, worked on Chrome DevTools. And we have Rowan Beishti. 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 Oh, OK. Yeah, he wasn't messed that one up. Um, so he works at uh, FT Labs with uh, Andrew and uh, Zone for FT Scroller. Um, and then we have Chris Lord from Mozilla, who is a platform engineer for uh, um, Firefox Mobile, uh, and so primarily on Android. Um, so to start, Shane has a little opening talk for us to give us a bit of a uh, kind of lay of the land of performance at the moment. So uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Shane O'Sullivan. I work as a UI engineer uh, at Facebook. Um, Spent a couple of years on the mobile side and uh, now working on our business interfaces. Um, um, as you said, I'm here with Rowan, Chris, uh, and Pavel. And we're going to talk a bit about um, some of the potholes that uh, are in the road to actually having a you know, performant and fast and non stuttery uh, website. Um, the two main things I'm really going to talk about are scrolling performance uh, of complex content, which is more or less a stress test for all rendering platforms, not just web. Yeah, people also have a problem with this on iOS. God knows they have a problem with it on Android. Um, and it more or less solves it, forces us to solve all the other problems. And the second one is memory management, which is uh, quite related. So we start off and say what the goal is. The goal is 60 frames per second animation with no drop frames. Um, this is kind of the panacea. Everybody wants to get here. Um, but. Uh, but it's not always possible. So let's have a fallback goal um, and say, let's if we can get to 30 frames per second animations, make this reliable, make it have no stuttering. Um, this often is achievable. And in a lot of user tests that we've done, this tends to perform a lot better than having something that runs at 60 frames per second some of the time, and even 40, 40 frames per second some of the time. So if it goes from 60 down to 40, back up to 60, People often see that as being worse than just having a steady 30 frames per second animation. Uh, so so uh, nice to have 60. If we can get a steady 30, you're generally in a fairly good place. Um, so what's stopping us getting there? Uh, there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, to start off with is the large DOM size. Uh, if you want to take something like Facebook Newsfeed, um, you have variable height rows uh, made up of large images, small images, no images, variable length text, everything changes size. And you don't know what size it is till you're trying to show it to somebody. Um, so, and also, as the if you have thousands of these, which you technically could, um, the browser just starts running into serious memory problems. So you have to decide things: when do you create it? Do you create it upfront and have take a an upfront hit? Do you create it, uh, create it lazily and take a hit as people are using your application? Um, that often depends on what you're trying to build. For example, Gmail takes a hit. Uh, up front because they expect you to leave the tab open for weeks. Um, Facebook goes the other way because it's more of a, a random browsing experience and they try to make the upfront hit very small and you know render later. So uh, okay, so one of the main problems we have is if you want to keep the DOM small, um, that basically means you've got to change it on the fly. If you have a lot of data to show and you don't want to have a big tree, you've got to change it on the, on the fly and that basically is great. You've got a nice small down, but that introduces a whole bunch of other problems, which we're going to get into. Um, one solution people come up with is have a pool of reusable DOM elements. Um, say you have 20 different types of rows you want to show, uh, have a pool of each of them and reuse them. Uh, so that way you don't go, go you know, going from a small image to a big image, back to a small image, something with no images, something with text only. Um, 
So this can help, um, but you still end up with kicking off page reflows if you're not careful. Um, also, uh, when you do start changing things, say you go from a small bit of text to a long bit of text, even inside something that you haven't technically changed the structure of, you can change the height of it, you can change the width of it, um, and often you need to know this. If you haven't measured everything ahead of time, then you need to know how big something is. For example, if you want to show somebody a scroll, or a scroll bar, they have to know uh, what size it is. But there's the main problem with this is that touching the DOM makes Ryan sad. Um, it makes him very, very sad, and you don't want to make Ryan sad. So measuring the size of a, a DOM node, um, it basically stops everything, makes the browser flush all its uh, pending operations, and slows everything down. So what do we do? Um, we'd like to keep it off the UI thread. This is possible in native. Um, for example, the Facebook iOS app does it, has a completely separate thread that more or less does everything the UI thread does, but does it off the UI thread, measures everything, renders everything, and then just passes it over. That'd be lovely. Um, we can't do that. Uh, one reason is we don't always have workers. Um, on the latest iOS, we do. On Android, we do. Um, but we don't always. Uh, also, workers on a single CPU are slow. If you try and run a worker on an iPhone 4, which only has a single core, um, you're not really getting any, any gain. I mean, yes, it's a, it's a different thread, but you know, it runs on the same CPU. And anyway, workers can't do DOM, so this doesn't really help you. So what can we do? Um, hide the scroll bar. Uh, don't tell people how much stuff is there. It's a dirty hack, but it works. Um, so yeah, uh, you don't have to measure a thousand rows because just don't tell them, just tell them keep scrolling. Um, but some people like scroll bars. So another thing you can do is measure when not busy. Uh, this can be fairly tricky because when are you not busy? You're not touching it now. What if you start measuring, you say I'm going to spend 100 milliseconds measuring the next X things, then in the middle of 100 milliseconds someone touches the page and you miss it because your JavaScript is running. Um, you can try and measure in the middle of a frame, which we've tried and do, done before, where we figured I spent five milliseconds out of this 60, 16 or 32 millisecond frame, and I'm going to use the rest to render ahead. Um, that can work, uh, but it's really tricky to do. Something that we're starting to play with now a bit as well is measuring on the server, um, which is just something we're only prototyping at the moment, but we figure in our use case we have at max a few thousand different <coughs> Um, ways to arrange in all the individual types of things in Newsfeed, and if you have an app like that, then you can technically render them ahead of time, figure out what you fit into, and just never measure the DOM at all. Um, I'm hopeful this might help, but uh, it doesn't fit every use case. But if it does, then you know, measure things once and then never measure them again. Uh, another annoying thing is repaints. Um, most of this comes in because images are unpredictable. Uh, they load when you don't want them to load, like when you're in the middle of an animation. Um, they load with the wrong size, so you end up clipping them, which has its own cost. Uh, or you end up resizing them, and it has a massive cost, which some people were talking about earlier. Not just network cost, but obviously performance cost. And finally, they have to be decoded. Um, as we just heard, WebP takes longer to decode than JPEG, and JPEG is bad enough as it is. Uh, so if you're decoding things in the middle of an animation, then you're going to have a bad time. So what do you do? Uh, some people defer all image loading until you finish an animation. Um, this is for new images. Uh, that can work, but you know it looks bad. I mean, you have a big empty thing scrolling by with a little bit of black text and a couple of links, and when you stop, everything pops in. It works. Uh, you get nice animation, and as a start, it's good. Other people use low-res images, which have a lower decode cost, but you know they still cause paint. Um, and what we're doing now, uh, or trying to do, is uh, figure out how much time each particular operation, including text changes and image changes, take per animation frame. And we figure we have a 16 millisecond animation frame. We have used 10 milliseconds. It normally takes six milliseconds to draw a small image, so we still have time. And if we don't, then we defer it, and you do get a blank image. And that gives you the nice effect of sometimes you'll see images scrolling past or images popping in in the middle of a scroll. Sometimes you don't get to it, but it tends to seem look better than the first one. Uh, that's very hard. You've got to write that yourself. You've got to write it in JavaScript. Um, would be nice if browsers did these things for you, but um, hopefully we might get there at some point. And another one is resizing. A lot of people think that resizing images, like just don't resize, don't, don't do it, just clip them. Um, often you can't. Uh, as people were talking about earlier, like Jackson was mentioning at Facebook, we have like four different sizes of images that we use. And if you clip them too much, then it just looks terrible. You cut off people's heads. 
and that kind of thing. And saying, okay, just ship the right size. Shipping the right size is hard. Uh, you got massive server costs. Um, it helps, uh, like I said, it helps here to be a large corporation where you can tell your, uh, tell like Akamai, you know, we really, really need a solution here and they will help you. If you're not a large corporation, you can't do that. Um, it's, it's very hard to say that if I say I want a 57 by 57 pixel image, you must serve it to me. Um, so uh, one thing you can do is get designers to calm down a little bit um, and just tell them, don't try loading images in like subtly different pixel sizes. Um, do you really need a 50 and a 52 pixel image? Maybe you don't. Uh, then just have a single 50 pixel image and you're done. Um, you know, designers like to have a free hand in everything, but you know, reality has to come into play at some point. Um, so yeah, one of the final things is decoding JPEGs. Um, a lot of people don't think about this. A lot of people, uh, they look at like um, the timeline on Chrome and you see a lot of paints and that kind of thing. But decoding JPEGs can be a very large hit, almost as much as uh, painting sometimes. One thing we're playing with is doing it in a worker thread, uh, do an XHR to the server, get down the data for a JPEG, decode it in JavaScript on a worker thread, ship the data URI off to the image on the UI thread, and then you only pay for the paint. In some cases that works, in some cases it doesn't. We've only rolled out a test. But uh, for, uh, for large images it seems to work, for small images it doesn't. It's horrible, and I wish we could have off-thread JPEG decoding, but um, such as it is, it still slows down our scrolling. Alex looks thoughtful. <laughs> uh, obviously there are other good solutions to this, but hopefully the guys will know some of them. And the last one uh, that we're probably going to end up mentioning is GC, which everybody knows stands for Gremlin Carnage. Um, okay, it really stands for Garbage Collection, but it might as well stand for Gremlin Carnage because it's just this random little monster that runs around and makes you very sad. Um, unless when he looks really cute like that and then everything's good. Um, so with Garbage Collection, you put all this effort into having a fantastically good um, smooth animation, and then something random comes in and takes up 100 milliseconds and kills everything. V8 has, in the last year or so, uh, year 80, 18 months, come up with incremental GC, which spreads the load a bit, but you still get hit by these large mark sweep uh, things that can still take a large amount of time. Um, one thing you can do is just go through your whole code and micro-optimize absolutely every tiny little piece to not use memory, to reuse events, to reuse all sorts of things. Um, it's painstaking, it takes forever. Um, and I don't know of a silver bullet, but um, uh, we will be discussing this and hopefully uh, somebody has a silver bullet because I want one. Um, all right, and with that, let's get on with the questions. Thanks, Shane. So I'm not sure exactly where, but somewhere out there there's another mic. So just keep in mind for this panel, we have a, a roving mic that will magically appear as you need it. So. So we're hoping for even more people talking in this, in this talk from the audience because everyone deals with performance. Um, okay, so the first question here. Okay, so from our very own Andrew Betts, um, we have the first question which is, with longer and longer lived pages, will web developers start having to spend time on memory management and is that a good thing? And I'd like to start off Rowan with this question. I think Shane covered some of it there. Um, I think Shane did cover some of it there. We are going to have to worry a lot more about memory, especially on memory constrained stuff like mobile devices. And the tools, the tooling has got better. Garbage collection has got better. Uh, I don't know how much everyone. I don't know how much everyone knows about. I don't know how much everyone knows about the, the current kind of memory implementations, but it's no longer retain release stuff. It's all very nice. Is anything still attached to the document? So no longer cycles to worry about. But you do still have to keep very careful track of objects and make sure you don't have detached DOM trees, massive memory loss there. And Chrome tools have got a lot better in this. You can do heap snapshots. You can diff your heap snapshots. You can work out where you're, you're leaking objects in your your, in your application lifecycle, but we are going to have to worry about a lot more. As Shane said, reuse isn't a civil bullet, but it's what we have to work with for the time being. Anyone else? It's a bad thing that we need to care about memory, but it's inevitable. We'll need to uh, take care of memory, and uh, we need to make it a standard part of our development practice. 
And not only we should care about the present state, but about the regressions as well. Because uh, you don't want to fix everything and then lose it all uh, with some regression bug. And uh, on the tools front, we are working on exposing better and better pictures. We are currently working on native memory uh, instrumentation so that you saw how much uh, DOM and strings and resources and images and decoded images are taking. Uh, but what we can see is that uh, apps model is, always, is most likely a source of the memory leak and unbounded memory growth. So uh, you should be using heap profiler for that. And yes, it's complex. And yes, uh, heap profiling and memory leak hunting is something, is kind of a last resort. You don't want to do that, but uh, you end up doing it. Uh, and you end up doing it not only for web, but in any development platform. So just make it a standard practice. Yeah, one, uh, one thing that we've run into is that often you, you know when your app is not doing anything, and you know that, like, for example, right after someone finishes scrolling, they're going to stop and read something for at least 100 milliseconds before they start doing interactions again. And one of the things that would be fantastic is if you could just say, right, I know my app state, now clean it up. You know, don't, don't, don't do it in two seconds time when they're scrolling again. You know, clean up now. And I know this has been brought up before to everybody who ever built, you know, a garbage collector. And they always say, you know, it's, you know, it, it's always best guess, or maybe that isn't the best time to do it, and all that kind of stuff. But um, being someone who doesn't actually know how the internals work, um, why is that? I'm not commenting on the GC, controlling GC questions. It's it's a tough area, and uh, uh, you should be really talking to the virtual machine uh, engineers and. Uh, Get the official story there, Paul. What is our official story? <laughs> <laughs> so the the answer uh, that you get from the vendors is always uh, we are going to do best for you. You don't want to control it, or otherwise you will lead us into trouble. But you really need to go into the details and talk to the actual engineers. Do we have any of them in the room? Well, as this relates directly to the next question, it's... Um, or a dozen of next questions. Like, what's that? Or a dozen of next questions on the GC. Yeah, so the, right. So, so this is kind of an interesting thing from a, from a standpoint of perhaps getting the answer from them. Um, but uh, the next person asks, which is Shapir from Israel, is should JavaScript be allowed to explicitly trigger garbage collection um, when the app is idling, say, or if the app knows when it's okay to do so? Um, or should it be allowed to prevent uh, GC when actually performing time critical operations. Um, so this is currently something that people don't really have control over, but I hear your take on it. I think the only other thing to bear in mind is that there are occasions when the browser is going to have to garbage collect if it's running out of memory. So there's always going to be points where you can't control it. But perhaps we could hint, I'd like the next 16 milliseconds, perhaps please don't garbage collect during that time. So. Um, GC observability is a major issue at TC39, so one of the things that I wound up doing is uh, one of Google's representatives to the standards body for JavaScript. And so um, being able to know exactly when garbage collection happens uh, has potentially very serious side effects for cross-document and cross-origin communication, um, which are not friendly. Uh, there's also the concern that exposing GC will bake into the web um, heuristics which are likely to be proven wrong any time now. So in the history of V8, we've gone from having a generational GC to having um, many, many, many other variants of generational GC. And if you bake in uh, invariants in your code based on V8, they'll be wrong under um, Nitro, and they'll be wrong under uh, Ion Monkey or whatever the next thing is out of the next vendor. Um, and so the optimizations you'll employ are likely to get you into a place where not only will you be wrong in the future version of the, v of the VM that you're currently attempting to tickle in the right way, you'll certainly be wrong on the other VMs too. So it's, it's a nasty place to end your code base up. I don't have anything to add to that. Any other perspectives from the panel? Have you, have you guys have run into like, situations where you felt like it would be a much better thing to be able to have control over these? Because um, you know, in a lot of native platforms, you have course, different controls over the, the VMs, like say in JVM and whatnot. Are there any other times in your experience where you've kind of dealt with wanting something like this? Um, yeah, I mean, 
Uh, yeah, uh, it's more from an extremely high level rather than uh, be able to observe specific things or even know when it's going to run. Um, more from a point of view of telling it, look, like you said, you know, I'm I'm starting to do something really complicated now. Just calm down, and if my memory grows by another 20 megabytes while you're waiting to GC, we please wait until I finish, and then you know, feel free to hit me with a big thing. I know it may not be possible, but it can't be that simple because you know we're trying to. Uh, balance the interests of the user who may have triggered your page to allocate those 20 megabytes versus should they go to swap now? What else should they be doing here in order to, what's the most valuable thing to do with those 20 megabytes? And the answer may not be your app. You may think it is, but you may not have a global view on what the user agent is doing for the user. And I think um, to some extent here, we're kind of trying to have our cake and eat it. Like, you kind of do have some control over GC to some extent in that you can just not write things in a way that will end up with objects to collect. I mean, well, like it sounds kind of silly, but I mean, that, that's how like, like in Java, like uh, on Firefox mobile for Android, like we have these problems in that a lot of our uh, code, like while you're panning and so on, is Java code. And if we create a load of objects during those frames, then at some point GC will come along like at a completely random time and take like more than a frame's worth of time to do its work. And the way we work around that is just by not doing that. Like we can't change the garbage collector and we probably wouldn't want to anyway really because then other things are gonna break and other assumptions we've made are gonna break. Like you can just write your code in such a way that it won't cause a lot of GC. No, that's true. Yeah, that's true, and you should be doing that anyway. But uh, it does just get to the point at some point. I mean, if you're trying to do things like I was saying there, or keep your DOM small and have some sort of complex controller that does all these things and recycles views and does all that kind of stuff, and you're you're doing all this to get around the problem of um, you're doing all this to get around the problem of large DOM and uh, avoid repaints and get as much reuse as you can, that inevitably leads to large memory usage. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you have con like static content like uh, you know buttons and icons, and you're swiping through those absolutely, but uh, if you simply have megabytes of data that as a person scrolls through, you've got to show them a piece at a time, it, it gets very difficult to start avoiding things, e even yeah. when you, uh, you know, cut it yeah. down as much as possible. I guess you, you kind of want to balance yeah. the two. Yeah. All right, moving on. So we've got a third question here um, from Jono from London, or Jono? Is that person in here? Jono? Anyway, um, so we got like a very talked about um, topic here, um, but with respect to tooling this time. So when using CSS to manually trigger hardware acceleration of DOM elements for animations, for example, the hack of using Translate Z0, uh, is there a tool or any way to measure how this impacts the users and GPU? They ask, uh, let's start with Goldman. Yeah, so you, you measure it uh, using timeline. And uh, I won't comment on whether it's a good practice or not to, for, uh, to force the hardware acceleration using that technique, and Paul can cover that one. Uh, but once you've done that, uh, you can, uh, in Chrome, and uh, it covers good, good part of WebKit, you can use timeline uh, to measure uh, both paints times and uh, just compare those. Uh, that will largely depend on whether you are using uh, Retina or not size of a screen was lever uh, accelerator, but you can do that. Um, you'll need to have an inventory for that because equipment differs. And uh, do you want to comment on the Translate Z? Uh, just one thing about uh, the Translate, uh, Translate Z for me um, is that uh, the, the way certainly in Chrome it's handled is that it creates you a new layer, but also a layer with a uh, backing surface. Um, so that effectively has really maps down to a texture that needs to be uploaded to the GPU. Uh, so the net result of this is that if you've got Translate Z across a load of elements, um, on desktop you might be fine because you've got a lot more VRAM to play with, but on mobile you're going to get punished because now you've got a load of textures that need to be uploaded to your GPU, and the, the upload time might be quite slow to get those textures from the CPU up to the GPU depending on the actual hardware you're running on. So it's one of these things that you know, it's, it's sort of used with caution. Um, and it may be that in your specific uh, implementation, it speeds things up because you've got enough VRAM to kind of cover that debt that you're kind of creating for yourself. 
Uh, and it also is good because, um, so again, in Chrome, if it supports it, it'll switch the rendering mode over to threaded compositing, which is often a good thing, especially if you've got a lot of animations. But you might just see, uh, as again, on mobile, you might see it crush your performance if you do it too much. Yeah, this is the same case in Firefox as well, where if you add a, any kind of transformation, then it will end up op not optimizing, but sort of making it appear on its own layer. Um, there are other things to consider as well when you're forcing layers on elements in that if you force something to become a new layer, you're also forcing layers to be underneath it and over it, depending on the structure of the document. And de again, depending on the structure of the document, you'd also be forcing things like alpha blending to happen. You're forcing things like over increased overdraw to happen. All of these are, and you have memory hit, you have GPU time hit as well. So, and, and at some point, like translate, translate Z zero might end up just being a null op anyway. It's it is already on WebKit. It's been kind of deprecated he, to trigger all the layer backs. The, the, right, so. Yeah, there may be like there are other ways to trigger the same behavior. So the the warning shot on that is yeah this might one this one might become null, but developers might gravitate towards an alternative way of triggering the same effect. But it's exactly what you're saying. It depends on your the context of when you're using it as to whether it's actually a suitable thing to do. Really. So there's certainly a lot of knowledge here and a lot of gotchas depending on the platform and what they fall down into doing, what actual rendering paths, right? Um, but I guess for this question, it'd be really interesting to point out maybe, especially with people uh, in the more constrained environments on mobile, um, what do you guys see out there for, for tooling to measure the impact of their, of their apps usage of, of this hack upon what they're doing? Yeah, this is quite a difficult thing because GPU behavior is wildly different. Um, depending on what vendor you have. So uh, Firefox does have a profiling tool built in which will profile um, like a, at the uh, native level where time is spent and it goes into JavaScript as well. So if you run your, your page or your WebGL app and you scroll around with the profile enabled and you stop, you can see where time is being spent. But um, in terms of like getting really granular results, that's quite hard. Like GL drivers quite often um, they'll defer work to the latest point possible. So you might find that although you're doing like a load of um, vertex upload or something like you're uploading a load of data to the, to the GPU or you're, um, you're blitting a load of things, you might find that actually all of that takes zero time and swap takes all of your time or clear takes all of your time or, or flush or some other command where the GPU is like, right, okay, we can't defer things any longer. We have to flush out all the work. And we can't really counteract that without doing, I guess, other cleverer things like having like a, a shim for the GL functions in the JavaScript so that we can log what commands you're using and use some kind of um, context to say, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing all of this. Maybe you shouldn't be uploading all of this data here. Or maybe you should think of using uh, like using more VBOs and uh, you know, batching your drawing rather than doing lots of separate drawing and things like this. But I think it's going to be quite difficult, nigh on impossible, to have a, a really granular general um, profiler when it comes to uh, GPU use. But yeah, Firefox has a built-in profiler. If it's not in the current release, it's probably in 19 or 20, I, I forget. And also, for the record, we have incremental GC also in 19 or 20. I just uh, thrown that out there. So before it gets to Firefox, we have it in Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the way you look at it, so there is no uh, GPU profiling, but uh, there are interesting cases on the timeline where you see uh, your CPU time uh, spent for JavaScript layout painting. And uh, it all adds up to some reasonable amount. And then there is this transparent bar. And you don't know why your frame has been skipped. And uh, the reason for that is the browser was waiting for GPU. Uh, however, we don't really see that uh, a lot, happening a lot in practice on like non-heavy uh, 3D apps whatsoever. So uh, in most cases, first thing you check is timeline, and you're most likely OK. And the detailed GPU profiling is, is stay, still ahead for Chrome as well. Yeah, it's, it's much better on desktop than it is on mobile, and most of my experience is mobile, so I'm probably going to be speaking from that perspective. Um, you worry less. I guess you've, everything is better on desktop. Um, the state of mobile GPUs, at least certainly on, 
on Android, although it's getting better as like Android based system tends to use GPUs more, like drivers have some pretty awful and incorrect behavior and just flat out bugs that will cause things like this. Like, you know, you won't you'll have hitches that will be very hard to trace and it will come down to something like uh, you've triggered something which might do like a, it might update part of a texture and that GPU driver sub image uploads are actually just terrible and you should never do them. Like we try and work around these things, but yeah, on, on, I don't know, it's on mobile it's hard, but on desktop it's yeah, less of a concern, I guess. I still have a question from the audience here. What's your name? Uh, hi, I'm DJ Fazzy Fist. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> Colt McCandless from Google. It's also worth noting that for those of you daring souls in here who compile Chromium, that there is access to the Skia debugger, uh, which is actually sort of a, the hardware GPU compositor. It's actually amazing the insight you can get from the Skia debugger. You can actually see the GPU performance for each CSS element on your page. You can actually see what your DOM is doing and what each button and how long that's taking on the GPU. Um, it's amazing insight if you're seeing problems in this area and definitely worth checking out if you're willing to compile Chromium. Skia, S-K-I-A. Yeah, Skia debugger. Check it out. Um, hi. <laughs> I wish uh, does it already uh, provide uh, traceability from DOM and CSS literally? Because uh, it was bound to instructions and uh, you couldn't really trace it into a particular selector and or um, CSS property. Uh, I don't believe you can now. Thanks, Pete. Uh, the latest one that I was playing with had some abilities there. Obviously, the tooling needs to get better across the board for, for getting GPU insight for these sorts of things, since kind of the future of web compositing performance is on the GPU anyway. So uh, for those of you who want to kind of try out and give feedback for this early stuff, definitely check out Skia Debugger and, and kind of get a chance to chart where these tools are going in the future. So the, the way it works pretty much is, if I remember it correctly, is uh, it logs everything that is happening, and then it replays it. and uh, while replaying, you can uh, assess the performance of the instructions that were uh, made. So, basic idea. Yeah, I think we do actually. I remember now on the la on a work week last year, we have a similar tool for recording um, GPU behavior and then playing it back. But I can't tell you anything about it, and I just forgotten, and it's not finished. So, I think you're that. That sounds really cool. You're definitely uh, well ahead there. <laughs> And I think the, the Chrome dev tools are just starting to expose the amount of GPU memory used. Is that correct? That's coming up? Uh, not yet. But it's coming, it's coming it's up coming, yes. very soon. So we uh, native memory pro uh, instrumentation started with the renderer, uh, and the GPU for us is outside of the renderer. I'm not sure if, uh, like we have, um, if you go to about memory in Firefox, you'll see lots of details about where your memory is being used. I'm not sure if that goes to GPU memory, though. That, that also works. I think it works. It should work on mobile. Great. So that's quite a bit about the tooling. So how about we move over to a, the next question, which is related and kind of touched on a bit in the beginning of this one, was um, how do you guys feel about uh, front-end developers and their understanding of which performance metrics they should actually be looking at these days, um, say both, uh, of course, on desktop, but by more importantly, mobile, the more constrained environment, um, should they be looking, you know, rendering, compositing, layout, how should they be using the tools? It's, I guess it, there aren't too many, it, we've probably done a, we've not done as good a job as we should have in that there aren't tools to measure certain things that you'd really want to know, or at least the tools are things like, oh, just use an HDMI video capture unit and do frame analysis, which is obviously not feasible for, you know, most people, I would say. Um, so, yeah, I think it's an understanding problem. Can we turn it back to the audience and uh, may I ask uh, how many of you have uh, experienced uh, issues, challenges, uh, profiling, fighting for rendering performance? If you could raise your hand for rendering performance. Okay, and uh, how many of you were using timeline to capture what's happening? Okay, so it's pretty much half of once, so that's your answer. So half of us realize what needs to be done, what uh, tooling-wise. Um. So how would that help me in a web view on iOS? 
it's uh, it's great that we have all these tools on our browsers, but a lot of performance of HTML5 is in the closed platforms. So what can we do to get those closed platforms to get the cool tools that we're building? So uh, those platforms diverge, uh, especially on the rendering front, it is true. Uh, on the CPU front, though, uh, they are very much alike. So you have a good clue on what's happening in iOS uh, WebView uh, when looking at Chrome, uh, unless you uh, enable threaded compositing or something like that. And uh, it, it often gives you a good clue. Uh, and um, image decode time will be proportional, because uh, what you're assessing is uh, uh, basically the CPU and the architecture of what you're running on. Um, so you have some clue, you have some, some good clue on that, but it is not precise. Uh, but also, I mean, what you should care about, um, I don't think should be, you know, what any one give, tool gives you or any one, like, performance metric. I mean, performance is not a, a goal in itself. Performance is, should be there to get you to, you know, increase whatever metric matters to you. Uh, so, for example, in Facebook, the reason we care so much about scrolling is that we did a test where we artificially introduced for, you know, some small number of people, 20, 30 million or something, where we uh, said, like, we, we'll have your scrolling frame rate on Android and iOS, uh, just artificially. Uh, we know you can do 60 FPS on an iPhone 5. We will give you 30 FPS, and engagement collapsed. You would still get, you know, there was no, we didn't introduce jerking. We just slowed down the frame rate, um, and engagement dropped. So we said, OK, therefore, scrolling matters to, for, to our engagement. And engagement is what matters. So I mean, if what you care about, you know, test all the different things for your app that actually matter. If like speed, like TTIF, like time to interaction is what's important to you, emphasize for that. If scrolling is important to you and you, you do stuff like newsfeed or like, you know, any kind of uh, image heavy thing, then optimize for, you know, not resizing images, optimize for, you know, um, yeah, uh, you know, for uh, not doing page reflows on uh, complex content. Um, uh, you know, if you really care about TTI, do server render. It's faster. Um, so it's, it, you know, try out 10 different things. I know it's time consuming, but the metric you should be looking at is, you know, what matters for you. Do you care that people look at 50 photos in an hour? You're a photo app. Fine. Optimize for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't think there's any one, like, silver bullet for this stuff. So same happened to Chrome. We consider scrolling very important. and. Uh, um, there is actually a tooling uh, to detect regressions on that front. Um, so there is a telemetry, the remote control for Chrome. And the team, uh, the rendering team, is using it in the following manner. This tool uh, can connect to remote devices, such as Android phones and Chrome OS and desktops, different builds, different versions of builds. So it connects to those, runs regression testing, uses timeline to get raw data back, and uh, builds the graphs. And um, any degrade in that graph is a showstopper, and the change that regressed it gets, gets rolled out of Chrome. So uh, the same thing that happens on the vendor front should be happening on the app front, and I'm sure it does. So the metric is scrolling matches here. So. I think kind of on a slight tangent, there are some practical things that are worth knowing that, um, I mean, before you even 30 seconds. While, while, you're making, while you're making your site, like you should take these things into consideration. So it's worth knowing to some extent what, uh, what things cause new stacking context to be created, for example. Because if you create a new stacking context, likelihood is you're going to create a new layer as well. Not necessarily, but I mean, it's, it's a reasonable kind of rule of thumb to go by. Like try and reduce the amount of stacking context. Try to reduce the amount of uh, like, for example, uh, if you have text, um, not having it on a solid background means that you're going to force alpha blending, and you're going to force that text to be rendered twice for subpixel anti-aliasing. Maybe not on mobile. We'll probably just use grayscale. But um, there are like lots of little things like this. Like, uh, don't if you're going to have like uh, gradients in your background, CSS gradients, don't change them all the time. Don't resize them <laughs> if you can help it. Um, try and avoid. Uh, fixed backgrounds because again you're going to force the foreground layers to have an alpha channel and force blending and so on like so, sort of small tips that like it's What's a good strategic advice there yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> move on to the next one here sorry so we've got um we got a pretty interesting question i think from um from james ford does uh kind of an age-old question perhaps but does using svgs and font icons for graphics over gifs and pings have an impact on the performance of a web page um how about more from like your actual 
experience of, of using such? Well, sorry, I was going to say recently um, we switched SVG to rather than going from like a, a single node in our display list to using all of our uh, display list nodes. So if you have an SVG that's got like, I don't know, a thousand different um, render nodes in it, um, then that will be represented in our display list. And we, we have open bugs. This did cause performance issues, because as you scroll through the page and you expose new areas of SVG, like we have to iterate <coughs> that whole list and render it and sort it into layers, decide which bits have changed and which haven't, and so on. Um, so yeah, SVGs are going to be, I mean, you, you can cache them, but assuming that you're using them for a reason and you're not just, I mean, if if you weren't going to plan on kind of showing them at different sizes or at uh, a site, like, um, yeah, you can, assuming that you were using SVG for a reason and you couldn't have just used a, a static image kind of thing, they are more expensive to use than just static images. And the same with fonts as well. Fonts are quite expensive to render. Um, so the answer is yeah, <laughs> I, I guess. They're more expensive. So maybe one example that I found recently, actually the Apple site uses SVGs uh, quite well or and badly. Well in the sense that they use them everywhere, for example, for the logo and all the rest. But I think what a lot of people miss is a complex SVG with a lot of path. A uh, complex SVG with a lot of paths is actually very expensive, even in, in network bytes. If you look at the complexity of the SVGs that they use, you can get like a 5x improvement if you just save it as a PNG. So it's, it's retina friendly, which is what Apple wants, but it's actually worse off for like render time of your page and network performance. Yeah. Does anyone have any comparative information about icon fonts versus SVG? We need to measure, and if we can't measure, we need to make sure we can measure. Can you not hear? Back. <clears throat> Never mind. Yeah, I don't know. No experience from Facebook on this? Or? No experience by me at Facebook at the very least. Uh, no. <coughs> All right, so let's move on to the next question then. A um, little bit of time here left. How much on the clock? Fifteen. So, um, so kind of a bit of a loaded question, but um, how can I find which CSS rules and properties are expensive to render on a particular page? Is a is kind of a next question and um, we are a bit of clarification. But we are working on that, but it's a hard one. You need to trace it all the way from the CSS property to the GL instruction, or paint instruction, ski instruction. And uh, it's a long way to go. Uh, there is a poor man's solution, though, that we've introduced recently as an experiment. Um, we can now put browser into the continuous repaint mode, where it continuously repaints, even if it doesn't need to, and it shows you the frame rate it can do it at. And if you're not touching a page, you can see that, OK, I can. Uh, Better say it says uh, number of milliseconds it spans per frame. So it says three milliseconds per frame. That's a good frame. You'll achieve 60 FPS with that. If it shows you 60 or like 100 milliseconds, then you can go and bisect your DOM. So that's the best we can offer at the moment. You go through DOM, you hide things, uh, it toggles visibility to noon, and uh, the number of milliseconds reduce. And then you figure out what is the part that was statically positioned or had a complex background or had some uh, gradient or whatsoever. It's a manual process, uh, but it is already way better than nothing. Will this help in the case where you're showing and hiding things, but let's say I modify something that will, will trigger both a repaint and a reflow? Does this like capture it in that second? That so this one is uh, only about paint. And paint meaning layout does not change, does, DOM does not change. So it's only about CSS and DOM that you have presented on the screen. Uh, REST, for the uh, REST information, you go uh, to the timeline. There are similar techniques uh, on c figuring out the recalc style or layout performance. Uh, they often end up with bisecting, unfortunately, as well. And we're working on improving that. Anything cool coming up in Firefox? Um, not, not much to add, really. Um, 
on mobile, I guess it's worth considering that um, certain pages, certain complex pages, and on certain mobile devices, it's really not feasible to expect the page to render very quickly, as in, you know, within like a reasonable 60 hertz or uh, 30 hertz time frame. Um, but we have asynchronous compositing to counter that. And what your goal then is, really, is to kind of do your work at clever times and partition it in clever ways so that you don't interrupt the asynchronous compositing uh, at inopportune times or for too long. We're on to the next question here. So um, it's perhaps a um, kind of a little bit redundant, but it's interesting to get the perspective real quick from, from both a Chrome and Firefox person. Um, so we use Translate Z0 to trigger hardware rendering, uh, you know, as people think. Um, should we have an API to explicitly do this? So this is obviously like um, uh, a bit tough, and I think we get some audience uh, input to this. But should there be, perhaps in general, um, any feedback from, from the app side uh, to get a little bit of um, like hopeful uh, kick into acceleration? Because if people are using this and they're finding it to, to a good effect, you know, is it something that maybe we, we want to, to make more real? So I think Paul and Alex have already covered this one from the platform perspective. When you were, when you were talking to GC, many things apply to this thing as well. Um, yeah, so. yeah this, this has come up, I guess, a few times, really. Like, do we want apps to be able to hint to GC when to collect? And do we want, I don't know, it's like every, every bit of control that you add is kind of. From your work on, on Android, have you found times where it would have been more useful for the app developer to, to give you a hint that they need that? Not really, <laughs> I guess. I mean, I think really we should just be cleverer about doing these things. Like, I think if you put that kind of control into users' hands, things are going to change too much pretty quickly to the point where it will just force bad behavior in future versions. Uh, from the point of view of people who write apps, um, yes, it would be lovely. Um, I don't know if it's feasible or not. Uh, it's just that on the web, as everybody knows, one of the reasons we're sitting here right now is that performance is a problem. Um, and on some other platforms, you do have the option of dropping down to a lower level if you need to, um, and if you have people who are sufficiently good enough to do so. Um, and I don't know if that's feasible on the web. Um, it would be nice if it was. I, you, I admit things change all the time. We're constantly updating our browsers. We're even updating them in the background now, so things do change all the time. And even on iOS, things change once a year. Um, so yes, uh, it would probably break everything. But um, you know, I mean, does, when you're when you try to be do smart things in general, um, often you know you're going to be missing, you know, an edge case, and an edge case could be 25% of all implementations. Um, so. I don't know. If there was a way to drop down lower and just say, look, I know what I'm doing, trust me, it would be great. It, like I said, you can do it on native platforms. <laughs> well, I, I guess you've got Canvas and WebGL. You can, you can do it like that. <laughs> True. So maybe time for one more question here. Um, so a question from Christina Auckland from Hampshire. Um, is there an overhead to using media queries, especially bubbling media queries in your experience, guys? Nothing wrong? No. No idea. Not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> then one more question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> we talked about this question for about five hours last night, or off and on. Um, I feel like beating a dead horse would it be possible to accelerate reflows, hardware accelerate. Now, so I think this, this question's a bit like confused into what it's asking, perhaps. Um, but it did bring up some interesting things last night, so I'll give a moment to just talk about what reflows are, perhaps from you guys, and, and how that may possibly be hardware accelerated. I think Google is definitely hiring, so if someone has some bright ideas on that, we'd be definitely interested. Uh, ditto. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I think the question might be slightly confused. So to kind of go to semi-first principles. I'm going to assume that you know DOM tree is something we all know. <laughs> but like uh, browsers tend to, after you get a DOM tree, it will get passed into a frame tree, which is a better representation of how it would get drawn. So that 
And then the frame tree will get processed where things, it will calculate where the position and size of things are. And that's, that bit is the reflow. So when you change something that causes a size to change, then reflow needs to happen because the size of certain elements will be dependent on other elements. I say elements, I mean, that's not quite true because we're in the frame tree now, but just, you know, for the most part. Um, so the, that's not something you could put on, I mean, you could put it on the GPU, I guess, but like, it'd be pretty pointless. Like all of that is in system memory, so you'd be shoving it over to GPU memory and writing a really complex set of shaders, I guess, to, <laughs> to work on it and then shovel it back. Um, like basically, the answer is no. But um, maybe there are some other f some things that we're not accelerating right now that we could, which might be an interesting question. So like from the frame tree, Firefox, um, or Gecko rather, will make a display list, which represents how it would draw the page. And then it processes the display list to create the layer tree. And I think a, a, a similar process happens in WebKit, possibly minus display list, or depending on what fork you're using. Uh, judging from conversation last night. Um, are there other things that we could accelerate maybe between those things or like during that thing? So for Firefox, like most of the rendering will happen on your CPU. Certain things will be harder accelerated like um, drawing a big image that might end up being uploaded to the GPU and scaled, for example, on the GPU. Or uh, transforms happen on the GPU, blending happens on the GPU, but maybe there are other things that could happen on the GPU. Like uh, we don't draw gradients on the GPU at the moment, and gradients are a huge hit. Like that's something we could do maybe, and other elements as well. There might be other ele element types that would uh, be able to take advantage of hardware accelerated rendering. Now the hint is that if you're experiencing a really slow layout, uh, most likely you are doing a total reflow. And uh, in WebKit, you're doing total reflow if your layout root is, is root of the document, which means uh, in this very message, uh, you mutated two parts of non-intersecting DOMs, and they ended up being the root the layout. So uh, you figure out what your layout root is. Uh, there are simple rules to follow to make your element a layout root, and make sure you don't screw it. I, I, um, just one, I think we've kind of mentioned this already, but just in case, um, like a lot of the optimizations that happen on the kind of rendering process are to do with delaying tasks and splitting them up. So things like if you change, like I mean, if you can make everything like a set width and height and never move it, that would be great. But if you do, um, if you do have need to change something, um, like if you change the width of something, um, that is going to trigger a reflow probably at some point. But that point could be any time between the time you do it and the time that the frame comes. And stuff might happen in between. And if possible, we'll coalesce these reflows. So, it, But on the other hand, if you change a width and then you immediately read back the width of an element that depended on that width, you're forcing that reflow to happen immediately. So, and then if you change something after that, then, you know, like you've got the double reflow situation. So I guess a tip that maybe batch stuff is a sort of general tip to avoid that. Yeah, so uh, to add to that, uh, we've often seen five total reflows happen within a frame. So it's not that the reflow is slow, it's that it's continuously happening within the same message. And uh, we have good tools for that. Uh, we will show you all the layouts and we will show you JavaScript stacks that invalidated the layout and that forced it. And you can see a continuous invocation of like five of them and you cut it into a single one and all of a sudden your performance is okay again. Yes, yeah, so actually real final question here um, from the audience is uh, from Paul Kinlan. He says, uh, yes, does scrolling performance in client side performance affect the time on the site, bounce rate, et cetera? And Shane was actually talking about something pretty interesting last night about what he's seen um, from Facebook's perspective. Yeah, I kind of mentioned it a bit earlier, but um, yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, well, what we kind of find on Facebook is that um, regardless of what you do, people have kind of assigned a certain amount of time every day to spend on, on the site. And the, you know, the more things that you can get them to do within, say, they want to spend 20 minutes a day, and if you, if you can show them twice as many pages during that day, um, then they will do twice as many things. The same goes for if 
um, people tend to scroll down. Um, we found that when they scroll more, they see more stories, they click like more, they comment on more things, um, they see people's faces in the site, send them more messages. Um, and when we did make, you know, add friction to scrolling, we, when we added, um, you know, varying scroll rates, when we added like slow, you know, consistently slow, slow rates, um, as soon as we made anything non-optimal when it comes to scrolling, then people often might stay on the site as long, so it didn't really affect bounce rates, but they would do far fewer things, um, uh, which is why we spend so much time obsessing about scroll rates. Um, so yeah, it, scroll rates like directly affect user engagement, um, on native, on web, on everything. Which means our, our basic site, which only serves HTML, and goes onto Nokia phones, gets fantastic engagement if you put it on an iPhone. Um, it's extremely fast, it's tiny, it looks ugly, and um, people engage with it really, really quickly. And you know what, it scrolls to 60 frames per second, because um, there's no JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, who knew? <laughs> Any last thoughts? Mm, not really. Um, <laughs> maybe it'd be nice, um, like we're, we're talking a lot about scrolling here, it's obviously very important and scroll behavior differs between basically every mobile browser like in quite big ways. Maybe this is something we should be or should have been collaborating on before. Maybe there should be an API for that, like some kind of meta tag or something. Yeah, I heard Chrome team were thinking we're like going to start looking at like scroll performance as you know, something to <coughs> instrument or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So that telemetry that I was talking about is the uh, regression testing for the scrolling performance, and there is a huge scrolling effort uh, that, among other things, moved uh, uh, the painting to the impulse site, including the image uh, decode and resize. And that's already available on Chrome for Android now. I don't know. Yeah, it's already enabled for Chrome for Android. It's uh, in the about flags on the desktop Chrome, so you can take a look at that. Oh, sorry, and well, one last thing I just remembered as well. In the um, in the Firefox built-in profiler, we have a mode that we call jank mode. You, you like tick a box, and then when you start the profiler and uh, you do some stuff and you stop it, it will basically show you, it will highlight on the profile exactly any hitches in, in panning. So any frame that took longer than 16 milliseconds or whatever to draw you can drill down into just the operations that are going on during that frame. And I think, yeah, no, I'm sure, the, <laughs> the, uh, that profiler works. Um, you can, over ADB, you can, so you, you can run it on your phone and profile it on the desktop, which is pretty handy. So just letting you know. So thanks, that was the performance channel. And, uh